What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. Coming up, the fellas put their 16s on rock and roll to check out 1986's Best Picture winner, Platoon. Tom Berenger and Willem Dafoe struggle with their terrible faces while Charlie Sheen experiences the joy of drugs. All this and nothing you can actually see this week on For Screen and Country. Thank you, yes, thank you so much. Oh, what a crowd, ladies and gentlemen. What a crowd. Thank you, thank you for coming out. Oh, yes, we up Brendan, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Brendan's here, I'm here. We're so happy to see you. Thank you, thank you for coming out to this dead jungle. Thank you. It's so, it's so heartening to see so many locals out here today to see our podcast. It's amazing. Brendan, how are you? I am. I'm doing fine. I am. Uh, I, I'm in. A, I'm in the jungles. I'm uh, yes. calling in on this podcast via radio. You you are downriver from me. Uh, we are both near the Cambodian border in the dense jungle of uh, Vietnam, and we are doing our own WrestleMania two. Brendan is a hundred miles down the river. I'm up here. We have both got our own crowds. Everybody, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I've also muted applause. my crowd. Um, yes, uh, J- <laughs> they're very quiet. No. They're very respectful, but they're here. Was, I'm very sorry, Jason. Just one second. No, no, I don't want to go surfing with you. No, that's dangerous. I don't care if Sam Bottoms is doing it too. Would you jump off a cliff if Sam Bottoms jumped off a cliff? Jesus, Robbie. Okay, sorry about that. Charlie don't surf. Well, Robbie Robbie Duval does. Oh, okay. He's, well, he's, tra- <laughs> he's playing the Sam Bottoms card, Jason, and quite frankly, Love I'm sick it. of it. It's, I'm tired of it. Weirdly enough. Get back home, Rob. Weirdly enough, Sam Bottoms, a top. Ironic. Mm. Yes. But we're not here to talk about Sam Bottoms' sexual position. Not yet. Uh, One day. Preference. We'll get there. We are here to talk about war movies, Brendan. We are here, deep in the jungles of Vietnam, to talk about 1986's Best Picture winner, starring Charlie Sheen and Willem Dafoe and Tom Berenger, Platoon. Before we go to the jungle, Brendan, let's head back to the desert. I don't like your location-based comedy. <laughs> Jason, I, I, in fact, loathe vac- uh, vacation-based. Well, I actually, I like vacation-based comedy. Location-based yes. comedy, though, lowest common denominator, dude, and you know it. So, you no, so you the are com- the Larry so the, the has to be... You are the Larry the Cable Guy of location-based comedy. So the comedy has to be that the family goes to the amusement park, but the amusement park itself cannot be the source of the, the comedy. Amusement park, if the amusement park is the fucking punchline, you're oh, oh, basically man. the wor- you're basically worse than Hitler. Well, now I know. Yeah. Well, it, speaking of Hitler, um no, I don't know why that was speaking. <laughs> was there, speaking of Hitler, none of, these, none of these people are uh, are similar to Hitler. I just want to state for I'm the aware. record right now that all of our listeners, not one of them is Hitler. I just want to make mention, except for that one person who I'm pretty sure was Hitler. Anyway, comments I, about... I, 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 I can say with 99% assurance, none of our listeners have Hitler DNA in their bodies. Wow, that's a that's a bold statement. You never know. There might be some DNA. It might be some, some passed down genes. Um, I know I certainly wouldn't tell anyone. <laughs> hey, guys, guess who yeah. my great-great-great-grandfather is? Adolf Hitler. Well, this is... Brendan, this is extremely easy to fix. If you are a listener of this podcast, we would just we just need a small sample of your DNA. Please send it to P.O. Box 69A, Fredericton, New Brunswick. 420 E3, Fake Street. E, 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 e. What? 420 Fake Street. 420 Fake Street. New Brunswick, <laughs> Fredericton, USA. Uh, speaking of, uh, of of relatives of famous people, um, 
of course, famous uh, screenwriter, blacklisted screenwriter Dalton Trumbo's uh, son uh, chimed in here. Uh, Matt T Bone Trumbo, of course, Dalton Trumbo, uh, famous Nazi. <laughs> That's, no, no. <laughs> not at all. Famous accused communist, Brendan. Yeah, that's right. They were all Nazis. Sorry, I'm just a big <laughs> Joe McCarthy fan. Anyway, Matt T-Bone Trumbo says, I thought it was fantastic. Fake baby put aside. It really shows the devolution of the bright-eyed, eager-to-fight younger man into the hardened machine war turns you into. Also, it does a great job at showing PTSD. Yes, agreed. That's one of the more positive aspects of this movie, Brendan. And I always like to start with something positive up front, no matter what the people are saying about the, the movie. But this movie, this is one of the more negative response I think we've gotten to a movie on this podcast. I'm not shocked, though. I had a feeling. No, no. I had a feeling. Given its kind of controversy and, and the character on which it is based, I can see. Um, but yes, but, but you know, some people do like it. Our next comment comes from Kevin McDonald of Kids in the Hall, oh. who writes... Yeah, I'm sure it's him. Uh, the one thing that sticks out to me about this movie was how quiet the crowd was when the end titles started. You couldn't hear a pin drop. It was that quiet. I haven't seen many movies at the theater where a crowd is completely hushed. Propaganda and a fake baby aside, it's technically well made. Bradley Cooper gives an amazing performance, and it's one of Clint's better directorial efforts. I don't know. I could probably name five movies I like better as Clint's directorial efforts, but... Uh, but I do absolutely agree. Bradley Cooper's performance is great, and it is very well made, and it has some pretty cool battle scenes. Yeah, Clint Eastwood made that movie where Kevin Costner looks at a little kid's dick. That was a better movie, right? What movie was that? I don't remember, but it it sure happened in a movie. Because <laughs> he's like, he's like, I got a small dick, and he's like, let me see, and he's like, ah, oh, that's not that small. And it was that's in a just movie. a little kid dick. What do you expect? It was um. It was a, a very weird moment in an otherwise pretty good movie. <laughs> was it called Mr. Mom? <laughs> yes. Uh, y- yes. Uh, Clint Eastwood's Mr. Mom. <laughs> um, well, I'd say the premise is is that he's a man, but he has to do the things that a mom does. <laughs> Great, Clint. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I just yeah. want to point out real quick, um, just for the first comment, uh, that that's actually a sticking point for me. I don't think it does a very good job of conveying PTSD. I'm just saying, just saying. I think it's a little on the nose. It is, but it, it, I mean, it makes the effort. It it at least puts, it makes the effort. Put that on well, the no, fucking DVD I mean, case, man. <laughs> that's it. Yes, I want that quote. My quote pasted on the DVD case. It makes the effort. It makes but, the effort. I mean, it, the the fact that it acknowledges acknowledges it at all is good because a lot of times war movies don't they're yeah. more about the the thrill of the you know the thrill of combat or whatever they're not necessarily trying to say something bigger obviously the movies on this list i think most of them are trying to say something a little more than just you know combat porn yeah um well but maybe, yeah it we'll... probably could have been handled in a better way but brendan 2015 was a different time oh shut up <laughs> andrew penn fitzgerald uh he of the wreck of the edmund uh, says, mm-hmm. I'm honorably retired from the Army and a gun owner slash enthusiast, but after skimming through Kyle's book and reading the New Yorker article on Kyle's habit of exaggerating and even making up stories out of whole cloth, I didn't want to spend a dime on his books or Clint's movie, which is understandable. Even beyond Kyle's lying is that he lied to bra- lied and bragged about killing and straight-up murder here in the U.S., um, and he talks about uh, recently read an incredibly well footnoted book, including a lot of r- real seals as sources, not the animals, um, on the violent culture that some in SEAL Team 6 and others like Kyle fell prey to or helped create. Uh, Chris Kyle is an example of the worst of Navy SEALs, not the best. The entire climax of the movie of him killing the deadly enemy sniper at long range is absolute fiction. Yeah. No, no clearly. And and we, we talked about that on the... Uh on the podcast. Uh, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's something that does can often happen in the military because you're trying to foster a culture that is a fighting culture because that's what mm-hmm. the military does, right? That's their ultimate job is they got to fight. But some people take it too far and they turn it into like just abuse. And I mean, that's, I mean, at one time that was how militaries kind of ran, but it's not, you know, it's not really helpful. Uh, especially if you want a person to have any chance of returning to, civilian life intact yeah well but, but i'm no but, expert but so. jason jason these aren't all that hateful i'm sure robert james cole has some lovely things to say about this movie right yeah uh, well yeah why not um i was by the way it was nice to hear from andrew fitzgerald an actual veteran yeah appreciate input from people that have actual I, expertise in this and i uh, hope you like area. my wreck of the edmund joke oh i'm sure he loved it <laughs> yeah robert james never heard cole it. uh <laughs> oh, oh robert james cole 
old Robert James Call, or Bob Jim, as we call him. Uh, it's an awful piece of jingoistic propaganda. Bradley Cooper does a decent acting job, but I don't think it should be celebrated in any capacity. I generally think every movie has merit, but this one I have difficulty finding the merit. Yeah. I mean, it's a technically well-made movie at the end of the day. Uh, see, I'm somewhere, I'm somewhere between this, like all out this movie is absolutely dreadful to between that and like the people that really love it because i don't think it's a it's a huge uh, success but i also mm-hmm. think it's these people definitely have some good points too about it being oh for sure not so great um yeah jason we have our, our old pal sharon horwat who hasn't seen this movie but she does tell us that the only thing i have ever known about it is the fakest baby i've ever seen in anything yeah, it's, I mean, it's a meme in of itself, so that's understandable, Sharon, but thank you for letting us know. Yes. Uh, our next uh, our next comment comes from another member of the military, oh, the old Sergeant Charger, Williams Holt. That's I can't it. say for you that he's a part of a real military. He may be part of the KISS Army. I did uh, and, he, and he writes, I was waiting for the part where he said he went to the Superdome during Katrina and sniped American civilian looters. The movie itself was certainly a well-made propaganda piece. Much like Sound of Freedom, it takes liberties with the story of the subject matter as well. At the And the ending is so star-spangled over the top, it completely ruined any good that came before it. But man, did it crank with business in January 2015. Yeah, and and <laughs> I don't know if this is on the level of like Sound of Freedom in terms of like a movie that I would avoid. Because that just sounds like it. That just, that I don't want any of that. <laughs> I'm actually fascinated to see that and see like how how well it is made. Well, good luck, dude, uh, because I don't know if you heard, but the theaters are shutting it down. They're turning down yeah. the AC. They're cutting out scenes. They're making it difficult for you to watch truth. <laughs> it's funny, uh, and I think part of the reason, and for real, part of the reason why these why there are empty theaters with this movie playing is that interest groups bought up a lot of tickets to give them away, oh. and they just. Didn't give them away. Oh, not even interest groups. Angel Studios, which is hilariously the name of the studio, um, mm-hmm. encouraged just people to buy a bunch of them and give them to the theaters to distribute them. And yeah, that's what's happening. It looks like nobody's there, but because people bought them in bulk for no one, it's racking up yeah. all these crazy box office numbers, which is like, at, in one on one hand, I'm like, that's so slimy. But on the other hand, I'm like, why don't more people do this? <laughs> I mean, it, hey, it, it doesn't matter if they're watching the movie as long as the money's coming you in, You want right? to get the message out there, guys. You got to get those people well, to stop going to the pizza huts. That's what they'd say, but they don't really care. And just, as long as the money comes in, they're happy. Yeah, and, and you know, we got to support a hero like Tim Ballard. Oh, excuse me. I just threw up on my mouth a little yeah. bit. Um, Last comment, Jason, comes from Joe Birch, and I think this sums it up. It's such a celebration of killing people that it made me feel ill. And that's it. And that's a strong comment because I mean, aren't most war movies, to some extent, whether whether intentionally or not, a celebration of killing war people, like killing war people, killing, uh, killing war people, people. <laughs> war people, certainly, uh, and and regular people, war people, peace people, all people can die in war. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, aren't all war movies, to some extent? I mean, I guess from that argument of like all war movies are exploitative by some nature because you're taking a pleasure in the thrill of this horrible thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think I think there's an argument to be made, though, that this certainly more than a lot of them. Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, that there's very little. Like, there's almost no character given to the other side in that movie. Yeah. Like, I mean, what's what's the most the most character we have is that one guy whose kid gets murdered. Right. And we barely get anything from him other than you know he gets sold out and his kid gets his head drilled. Yeah, it does seem kind of. I don't know. It does seem pretty raw, raw, raw about uh, about snipers, the most dangerous job in the world. Um, okay, so now that we've we've read the comments about American Sniper, ready to move on. We, we're going to move on to this week's movie, and uh, we're going to talk about Platoon. This is the end. Oh, wait, sorry. Wrong movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Platoon, uh, 1986, like you said, uh, Mr. Ollie Stone, uh, his first, uh, no, not his first movie. I don't know what I'm talking about, Jason. Uh, so to recover, I'm just going to tell you who's in this movie. Um, this is a movie in which the top build actor is actually Tom Berenger, who is very much the villain of the film. Um, mm-hmm. Tom Berenger, we've got Willem Dafoe, we've got a fresh-faced, innocent lamb and charlie sheen 
We've got uh, a host of interesting supporting uh, actors here. We've got uh, Keith David, uh, mm-hmm. Forrest Whitaker, uh, Kevin Dillon, John C. Baby, baby, young Kevin Dillon. Just a little little baby Kevin Dillon. He ain't he ain't uh, drama yet. Uh, no. Nope. We've got uh, John C. McGinley, uh, Tony Todd. Uh, well, there's our Star Trek connection. Tony Todd, of course. Uh, Kern, Worf's brother on Star Trek. <laughs> I like how you went to that, and I was going to say Candyman himself. The Candyman, yes, of course. Um, we've got, of course, a great performance from Oliver Stone as Alpha Company Major in Bunker Uncredited. <laughs> um, good job. And he gets blown up real good. Of course, Dale Dye, uh, the, the yes. guy who instructed, uh, who who went through the boot camp with all the actors, which we'll talk about in a bit here, um, is in the movie as well in a cameo. And I don't think there's anyone else that I'm forgetting. Um, I think that's it. Uh, oh, oh, there was a guy named uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Deep. John Deep? I believe it's pronounced Depp. John Depp. John Depp yes, is also young, in the movie. Uh, young newcomer John Depp. Yeah, who has like brief role. like maybe like four lines. <laughs> maybe he's, he's the interpreter. Yeah, yeah. So uh, th- yeah, and directed by Oliver Stone. So this is a uh, this is this is a big movie. Like like we heard in the intro. Spoiler alert. Um, best Picture of 1986. Yeah, this was this won a bunch of Oscars actually. Oh yeah. Um, Jason, Platoon. The heck is uh the heck is platoon about? Are we in Vietnam now, man? Are we in we, the shit? We are in Vietnam. We are in the shit. We are in the suck. We are we are that. I, maybe that's what they said about Iraq. But we are we are in we are in it. Um, this is a movie that I, based on what I know, is basically Oliver Stone kind of reconciling his own experience in Vietnam. Uh, like Oliver he, Stone turns out like he took a vacation first, or no, he went there uh, for combat duty. Oh. He like. Charlie Sheen's character specifically re- like enlisted, wasn't drafted, enlisted, and specifically requested combat duty. Mm-hmm. So he went over there, spent 15 months there, and man, he earned like a bronze, st- like two bronze stars or a bronze star with two devices or something and some other medals. Like he he went through it, and he was the first Vietnam veteran to make a movie about Vietnam. Yes, yes, and yeah. I don't know, uh, like I don't know if it was um, heavily marketed around that idea, but I do know that um, this is also, I think you mentioned it, and I think this is this is also one of, if not the first, uh, movie to depict a war without the participation of the American military. Yeah, they, uh, and and when you see the movie, you get it because yeah. they're not particularly complimentary to the U.S. Army and its activities in Vietnam. But this is coming from a guy who was there. Which is also so. not like you watch now and you're like, well, that's not a novel thing to see anymore. But certainly in 1986, it was kind of a big deal. I mean, you had Apocalypse Now in 1979, which did depict some of that. But I don't know, not as overtly as this movie. Mm. I think I think this... Apocalypse Now, they could get away with saying with like, oh, these are just a, a section of people going on this mission that aren't so great. But in this movie, it's like, no, these are the soldiers, and these are some of the horrible things they did. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and this movie is not like a a chronicle of a true events necessarily, but it is inspired from shit that happened to Oliver Stone in Vietnam, but also other stuff that happened uh, that was known in the media at the time, such as the, uh, the My Lai Massacre, uh, where U.S. soldiers executed, well, murdered, really, 300 civilians, I think, in a, in a Vietnamese village. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, um, it was a rough war. <laughs> I mean, wars are, well, all war is rough, really. But to me, this, this was is also war. like a good companion piece to like. I was going to say Oliver Stone's other movie, but it's not Oliver Stone's movie. But it's a kind of a good companion piece to uh, Casualties of War. If anyone, yes. if anyone else has seen that one, um, similarly, real bad hombres in Vietnam. Hmm. Uh, but coming out after this, so Oliver Stone kind of opens up the door for that. I think a little bit, and it's also like. Before you get into the plot, I just want to say, too, if you are a Vietnam veteran and you are directing a movie about Vietnam, it's pretty hard. I'm not saying he didn't, you know, um, exaggerate a few things for entertainment purposes or for story purposes, but it's pretty hard to criticize beca- the guy that was there. Like, it's just it, – it puts up a, a little bit of a barrier around yourself. Yeah. It's like, look, I literally know. I was literally there in the jungle, so trust me on this. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I just, I, I just imagine some critic, you know, saying some line about that, and 
Oliver Stone is like, uh, do you want to see the pictures? <laughs> like, yeah, like, it, it's it's, it's 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 interesting to think about um, doing that. Like, you, you, like I said, you just put you're just putting you're making your movie just a little more critic proof. Not that they can say, not that they can't say it was you know good or bad, but it's hard mm. to attack the accuracy of it. Yeah. So this movie is pretty much the chronicle of of our main characters journey from fresh recruit uh dropped out of college to join the army because of course in college you got deferment so you didn't have to go until you were done uh dropped out of college to join the army and showed up in vietnam and wasn't quite prepared for what he was in for and we see his arc throughout the movie from this green newbie who you know throws up at the first sight of a uh, of a dead vietnamese soldier mm -hmm. to this hardened battle veteran who's being evacuated out finally after he's been injured Yes, and this man, of uh, course, is Chris Taylor, as played by Charlie Sheen. Yes. Now, Charlie Sheen is the main character, and that's kind of the main thrust, but really the the drama of the movie is the push and pull between the two uh, sergeants that command Charlie Sheen, his squad sergeant, uh, Sergeant Elias, played by Willem Dafoe, Elias. and his uh, Elias, 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 whatever the fuck. No, I just, and, don't, I just uh, don't want to disrespect his memory, that's all. Of course. And uh, superstar Bobby Barnes, played by uh, uh, Tom Berenger, S who is their staff sergeant. Superstar and Bobby Barnes? Is that a reference? That's, that's a knowledge fight reference. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, Robert Barnes, he is, uh, he's their staff sergeant and he is a hard man. He has been in the shit a long time. And Elias and Barnes are two different sides of the coin, really. This is their struggle. Elias is a much more humanistic person. He gives a shit about his troops um, and at various points in the movie attempts to stop Barnes from committing atrocities. Barnes yeah. is very much the guy who's got, he's in, he's like, I'm here, I'm here to do this job. We need to be able to do this job however we need to do this job if we're going to win this war. And all the pussies back in Washington don't want to let us take the gloves off kind of stuff, you know? Uh, whereas, like I say, Elias is much more about like, no, we don't just murder people. Well, <laughs> or rape people, and that's but and that's one of the most interesting things right away is that Oliver Stone went um, against type for casting for that because mm. Defoe very much at the time and like still uh, known for playing villains. Like you see Willem Defoe yes. and you're like, oh fuck, what's he up to? He, and Tom Berenger at the time very much playing heroic characters and like good guys for the most part. Mm. So casting them as the in the opposite roles is a very interesting thing, and it also makes it like more alarming when you see some of the stuff mm. that Behringer does. Um, and, and it's, it's nice to see Defoe kind of in a, like a sweeter role. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and the performances in this movie, I mean, well, they're both, everybody's great, Yeah, but God damn it. Tom Behringer deserved an Oscar for this movie. I don't know if he got it, but he deserved it. Well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right, so good. right now, the other person that stands out to me, you know, we listed all those supporting actors and a ah. lot of them don't have like a lot of screen time, but John C. McGinley, man. Yes. He brings it in this movie. I don't think I've oh, ever yeah. seen a performance quite like that from him. He's intense as fuck. And of course, John, John is a favorite of Oliver Stone's. We remember him from Wall Street, of course. Um, and, and, and But you know, he is... He is intense as fuck in this movie, and I'm wondering if his character is supposed to be like a like a speed addict, like a stimulant addict, because he's got that vibe to him. He does, uh, and I think being very jerky and bouncy and 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 you know, just always up. He's always been a great character actor too. I think younger younger fans would know him as um, uh, well, obviously from Scrubs. Uh, yes, you may Dr. Cox you, on Scrubs. You may also know him from Office Space. Um, yep. but just a great, like a guy who's been around for a long, long time, just a great character actor. And by all accounts, everybody really likes working with him. So that's good. And of course this movie features the coolest motherfucker on the planet, Keith David. Keith David's great. Uh, and is playing King in this movie. And he's just a pleasure to watch whenever he's on screen. Oh, Keith yeah. David. He's just so fun. Like everybody else is, is everybody else is good. Like there's no real weak oh, yeah. points. I think Kevin Dillon, when he does his kind of switch is, it's oh, terrifying. Um, oh, he is. He's one of the most terrifying things in this movie. When he fucking caves in that woman's head with his rifle butt, mm -hmm. not woman, the, 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 the boy. kid, the, the clearly intellectually disabled boy. Yes. Fucked. Well, because and, and because again, and it, I think I think an intentional thing is to make him the most fresh-faced kind of character 
just mm-hmm. snapping. Like he he, yeah. he starts out like you know when he when you first see him, he's not great. Like he's pretty. I mean, he's on Barnes' squad, right? He he can't be yeah. that great. Um, but when he does that, that's like the the t- tipping point. I I wrote down like when when you see that. Um, that's like throughout the movie when you see like Taylor, like Charlie Sheen start to be affected by stuff and he gets close to, to reaching that line. Bunny, like Kevin Dillon's character is the one that cross is the version of Sheen that crosses that line. Like he, he but just like, does it. It's not even that he like snaps so much. It's just that he's into it. Oh yeah. That's he's what down. I mean. He's the guy saying, let's waste this whole village. Let's do it. And he's encouraging him to shoot the old lady or shoot the intellectually disabled kid. Like, do it, man. Well, do it. Waste him. Well, when he kills that kid, he even says, like, oh, man, I ain't never seen brains like that. Yeah. In, like, a, in like a, I'm impressed by this kind of way. Yes. And it's shocking because it's not, there's no regret. There's no, it's just like, wow, did you see that? Jason, this movie is, we've. This is a long way from <laughs> from Hacksaw Ridge and American yes. Sniper. This is this is a movie in which th- there is no glory here. There is no patriotism. Yep. There is no look at these heroes. This is this is grimy. This is gritty. This is gross. This is nasty. This is hot. This is sweaty. This movie might be nominated for sweatiest film by the end of this because, <laughs> and it makes sense because they're in the jungle and it rains and, oh man, the scene, one of the scenes, just a little thing that got me is that they're in this like downpouring monsoon, right? Mm-hmm. And then the rain stops and it's just quiet. The air is dead. You can hear the bugs. There's not a stitch of wind. It's just after that rain, you're just in that humidity and you're getting covered in bugs and you're wet. It just it oh it's the worst. I also got to think that it sounds like the worst. I'll, I'm also going to ask you this: if this movie was made today, 100 percent they will put in the song "Welcome to the Jungle," right? When they're getting there, sure. I, think I, so. I you know what? I think it's good. I mean, Oliver Stone has Oliver Stone really? I mean, I haven't watched a lot of Oliver Stone movies recently. I don't remember him being a Quentin Tarantino when it comes to music. Certainly not in this one. He couldn't afford it. Well, no, I in just fact, think I'm, I just think no, no. I'm not saying Oliver Stone directing this movie. I'm just saying if this movie was made today. I feel yeah. like Welcome to the Jungle would be like right at the beginning. Cause... Welcome to the Jungle or or one of the, you know, classic go-to Vietnam trope Something songs. You're, you're fortunate. In here. Yeah, Buffalo Springfield, Your Fortunate Son, CCR, You're uh, Going Up the Country by Canned Heat. You know, all the classics mm-hmm. that they probably didn't actually listen to that much in Vietnam. Apparently, as I understand, the Vietnam soldiers were more likely to listen to like bubblegum pop music because it was... Uh, more positive and reminded them of home. Yeah, I don't know if I if I was in if I was in Vietnam, uh, fighting one of the fucking worst wars in history, that I would enjoy listening to uh, you know d- dour music, <laughs> yeah. bringing me down <laughs> even more. It's like, I get it. It sucks. I'm already here. I know it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Stop reminding me how shitty this is. Yeah. But Jason, and... in terms of the plot, I mean, it's basically just them in Vietnam, right, going through the shit. Like yeah. you said, the conflict is Barnes and Elias, but mm. really. The plot is, it's not really, there's not really much of a plot. It's just them it's, in it's, Vietnam. The conflict is is man attempting to wrestle with himself yeah. and the to try to maintain his humanity in an in inhumane situation like this. I do really uh, think it's interesting, too, because I think this is the first movie we've covered where... You know, obviously, like we said, any any movies and anti- every movie's anti-war, every movie's pro-war to some extent, but it's mm-hmm. anti-war, but it really doesn't have any of the politics. This is th- there's none of that in here. It's just anti-war in the sense that what are we do like, what are we doing? Um, I think the only real political, the only time the movie comes close to making a political statement, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but this movie has an amazing score, which is used yes. uh, not a lot sparingly. But it's used at the beginning a lot when they're getting there. And it's very, like, foreboding. Like, oh, this is, Mm -hmm. guys, brace yourself. This is not going to be good. And then it's used again at the end of the movie when Sheen is actually returning home. And to me, that's, like, that might be the movie saying, like, eh, nothing's changed. It's all the same. Yeah. You just saw all those people die and really for no reason. For nothing. For nothing. Um. Yeah, and it was, of course, you know, at the time, I don't think conservatives were particularly happy with this movie because, oh, it made the Americans look bad. And, and it's crazy to think about that, too, because Stone is not, certainly not uh, a one that avoids politics in, in his movies no, and in real life. Vladimir He's Putin. always been one of those weirdo, uh, uh, weirdo leftist types uh, to the point 
Like he's for some reason is like buddies with Vladimir Putin. Yeah. He did a, a documentary about him a few years back that was very uh, fawning. <laughs> it's very he's a very strange man. He also strange gets, guy. He also does a very angry interviews about other movies, and I'm like, guy, just do sure. your own thing. <laughs> just do your own thing. I mean, he's a good film director. He does, not everything's a hit, but the guy knows what he's doing. I mean, they're not all savages, thankfully. He's one of those. He's one of those uh, directors. I'm now deeming the mad about Marvels. Who just like? Oh yes. He, he's. Uh, excuse me. Would you like to hear my take about Marvel movies? Like, no, I don't care. No, I'm gonna enjoy them, and I'm gonna enjoy your stuff. So just shut the fuck up. I, honestly, Oliver, I want to see Oliver Stone direct a Marvel fuck movie. Yeah, to let's see what do the it. fuck that is. Let's do it. <laughs> Please. Oliver Stone's Captain America <laughs> Four. But what what I really like about this movie too is its construction seems to be like really emblematic of the experience of the soldier because like, so we have him get there, you know, it's very innocent. The uniforms are clean. You know, he's, he's starting to get to know everybody and getting to see these veterans that barely give him the time of day, because as is so often the case, you don't want to get to know green troops because they're probably going to die. Yeah. Well, even say it's only when they've survived, they could become your friend. (laughs) Isn't there even a line where it says like, if you're going to die, it's better to die in the first couple of weeks. Exactly. So you don't suffer as much. Yeah. Jesus. But throughout this movie, so we get there, we get that initial sense of foreboding. He's like, what have, you know, what have I got myself into? He gets out there for the first time, the marching, the heat, just the physical act of being there is just crushing him. Yeah. <laughs> and then, for, and then, so that's, so he's experiencing that and getting dragged along. And then he sees his first dead body. So we have that moment. And then we have that bit of the movie where it's like, He's getting to know the soldiers. We get a lot of like really good macho ass dialogue between them. Not like predator level macho, but more realistic macho. Yeah, everybody has time to bleed in this movie. Yes, there, and there's a lot of great lines. And so he's, you know, it's it's we're experiencing that process of getting to know the unit. But then as the movie goes on, when we have that first big combat scene, and it's just you know it freaks the fuck out of him as well as anybody else who's new. And of course, the new guy that comes in with them dies and. But then the movie continues going, and then we get to those points where we start seeing the atrocities start to happen, the village scene and everything. And that's when the movie starts to become actually shocking to me. Like, Mm -hmm. it's been, we've been worked up to this point. It's been kind of, you know, standard war movie stuff. But then we hit this, and it really starts to drive it home. And I think it's similar for Charlie Sheen's character, who's like, it's bad. I know it's bad. Got my guys at my back. It's bad, but we can get through this. But then seeing that, seeing civilians being executed, seeing a girl being raped, uh, for no reason, like it's just it 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 affects him deeply. And, obviously, how could it not? And and also, um, I mean, the way it starts because the movie starts out, Sheen is very much complimentary of Barnes. Like he thinks he's like yes. a great leader, you know, no bullshit kind of guy. And if it was sure, if it was just that aspect of him, and he wasn't a psycho, yeah, of course, it'd be a, a guy you'd want uh, in your unit. But then. And then he, they even say, like, you know, uh, they find one of their soldier buddies who's been killed and strung up as, like, a display. Yeah. And their revenge is to go into this village, which probably has nothing to do with any of this. They, Most likely. They, and if they are providing food and weapons for the Viet Cong, they're certainly doing it under duress. Like, they're not yeah. they're not there to be like, yeah, go Viet Cong. We love this war. Like, and, and, of course... They go into this village as revenge, and uh, Taylor, like Sheen, says in the voiceover, you know, that day we loved him. That day we loved Barnes. He was our guy Mm -hmm. because he was leading the charge. And it starts out very much like that. They go in, and it's almost like the movie is like – it's almost like a different movie at first because you're like, oh, yeah, revenge. Yeah, let's do this. And he's like, fuck you. You're helping the Viet Cong. But then the the switch, I think, is when Bunny gets involved – and when yeah. you see that kid that has one leg and obviously, like you said, developmentally disabled and Bunny just evi- like caves in his head. And that's when you're like, yeah. oh, hold on a second. And then you see that. And then the scene where Barnes just murders that old woman, shoots mm. her in the head yeah. for, for just because she was yelling shut up. Yeah. for getting upset because they just killed her son. It's insane. And that's yeah. And that's when you're like, oh. And they burn down the entire village, lead some of them away as prisoners. Who knows what happened to those people? But because yeah. you never see them again, but they burn down the entire village. And you're right; that is the point in the movie where you're like, "Oh shit!" Like, okay, we're this is not this, this is, is this is different than every other war. War. This is 
chaos and craziness. I mean, I, I, I mean, war, war is hell, right? Yeah. Across the board, war is always bad. But you wonder sometimes, like, were they torching entire villages in World War II? I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised in the Japanese side on both on both combatants' sides. I don't know about in Europe though. I mean, I mean, they must have. Uh, sure. I mean, we bombed the shit out of entire cities, so burning down a village isn't that crazy. I mean, surely many, many innocent people died in the other wars, but oh yeah. There's something about this one that's just so much more malicious and vicious and yeah. like just just like you said there's there's a scene it's very quick but Oliver Stone based this on something he witnessed with his own two eyes. There's a scene where hmm. Sheen has to actually come in and pick up a young girl because two of the soldiers are trying to rape her just like yeah. casually in the middle of the open field. Yeah, and they like what are you lamo? Yeah. <laughs> and you could and and what gets me about that scene Jason is when they cut to the other soldier who was about to do it and there's a look in his eyes that's just like he's keyed in. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, and that is sort of based on yeah, that I I'm sure that happened a million times. Uh, well, Stone said the he war, saw was... that specifically. Like he specifically yeah. had to step in. Uh, but there was also yeah. there was also an incident. Uh, I think it's uh, the incident at Hill One Thirty or One Sixty Four or something. I'd have to look it up this to might, be sure. This but might be what casualties of war to, is based on. Yes, exactly. It was uh, where where a squad uh, raped a girl and then killed her, and one of the members of the squad was not having it, and he reported it. And despite death threats and stuff, like he eventually got justice done. Yeah. And these guys did get a you know put in prison that is yeah that is what that other movie is about for sure yeah which is and that's the that's one of the craziest things about war is trying to be an ethical soldier trying to be a soldier who follows the rules of war because your commander isn't necessarily go, always going to give you a legal order but it's your duty as a soldier to refuse any illegal order mm -hmm. and that is refusing that illegal order it might get you shot depending on who your commander is but you got to do it well, and maybe but a lot of guys don't just like, oh, boss says do it. We do it. And and, and Tom Berenger even makes that point at one point where he talks about the machinery. He's like, I don't care what you do, but you got to follow orders because if the machine breaks down, then we break down. Yeah. Which, again, it's it, I think the scariest thing about him. And I think maybe we should talk about Barnes and Elias here at this point. But the scariest thing about mm -hmm. Barnes is that some of the stuff he says in a different context makes sense. Like the stuff no, where he's, he's saying, like, he, it, like you said, if you don't, if there's a, if there's a break in the machine, everything breaks down, which is kind of true. He is looking at this from a strictly practical, realist perspective. But he he's, also does a lot of psychopathic things. Oh yeah, like, and and that I think comes from just the insanity of being there for as long as he has, and a guy who's clearly been through the shit, the guy whose face is all fucked up. Oh yeah, there's those from injuries that he's got, so many scars on his face, yeah. and and and. Almost to the point where he can barely, like, he doesn't really emote in any way. He's pretty stern. But, like, if, even if he yeah. did, I don't think you could even tell. Like, that's how messed up it is. It looks like, his face looks like a fucking jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, it's like his his emotions are long gone from him. Yeah. I, I do I do like the scene where he's in the bunker with them and, and he comes in and he's he's like, he's like, well, you boys smoking that stuff. I don't need that stuff. And then proceeds to take a huge swig of whiskey out of his bottle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he also takes a huge puff, too. He does eventually, yes. Uh, I'm not sure. By the way, we'll talk about this, yeah. but I'm not sure if they're just smoking weed or if there's some opium in there, because I saw some opium. They look like opium pipes. I don't but. think they were just smoking weed. <laughs> um, but, okay, so Burns is, like you said, he's clearly been there a long-ass time. They, they even talk about, like, how much he's been shot at and, like, grenades blown up near his face. And, you know, at one point, one of the soldiers says, the only one that's going to kill Burns is Burns. Like, you're not going to yeah. take him out. And then on... Um, on the opposite side, of course, we have Elias, played by Willem Dafoe, a another f phenomenal performance. Oh, um, yes. Who, I, I read a lot of articles that he's very much like a Jesus figure, like a like a Christ figure. I mean, there's even that pose, right? That crucif yeah. crucified pose. But I don't know. Sort I don't of. know. I don't know that I'm fully on board with that. I do think that, um, because the interesting thing is, so, so Dafoe's pose, uh, the famous pose from the poster was improvised hmm. it wasn't in the okay. script so of course we to get to that um defoe is obviously the, the polar opposite of burns he is very much looking out for his guys as much as possible but he's not going to commit war atrocities um to get there um i think i honestly brendan i think they both give a shit about their guys but in different it, ways sure and, in, and show it in different ways yeah yeah yeah. well i think burns cares less about defoe's squad 
Yes. <laughs> like, clearly. He, he does care about his own guys. He's always sure. telling him, like, you know, put put your guys out there. Put your guys out there. And, I won't, you know, Elias has to be at some points being like, I only have five men at this point. Like, they can't, they can't guard that huge stretch of land that you want them to be at. Yeah. But, um, but eventually, uh, Elias, much like we talked about that happens in Casualties of War, he reports Burns for, for yeah. killing that woman and, and raiding that village and, you know, all the atrocities they committed. And even having, even having not seen the movie, when I first saw this, I said, oh, there's Elias's death certificate right there. Because Barnes yeah. is certainly not above doing, like, getting revenge or, or protecting himself from, uh, you know, from, from any kind of uh, prosecution. Yeah. So uh, as they're kind of report, as he's kind of reporting it, you know, he, and he, the guy even says, you're both on ceasefire. Um, yeah. Which I, yeah, the commander. He's like, look, look, look. We'll deal with this after the battle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. We. Yeah. We will. But he says you're both on ceasefire. So does that mean that he didn't want any either of them to have guns during the battle? No, no. It meant he wanted them to stop fucking fighting with each other. Oh, okay. You're on okay. ceasefire. Like he's telling them to knock it off. Because I was and do like, job. I, I, when I thought that was it, I was like, whoa, that. So you're just gonna let them both get killed? <laughs> <laughs> um. But then you know, obviously, Elias goes off and Burns finds him and shoots him. And then yes. we get the scene where they're taking off in the helicopters. He tells, you know, he tells Taylor, he tells Sheen, like, yeah, yeah Elias died, Elias died. Barnes is a lot of things, not a good liar. Um, they take off in the helicopters, and they see Elias, and they're coming back around. You think they, in, in, in many other war movies, they come back around and make a heroic rescue. But this is not what happens. There's too many Viet Cong soldiers. Hmm. They shoot up uh, Elias, and he does that pose, or he reaches his arms out up into the sky, and... And falls. That famous poster pose. Famous poster pose. Yeah, it's the poster. It's a big spoiler on the poster. <laughs> Although I guess you can't tell he's being shot. But, you can't tell who it is. Or who it is, yeah. But um, apparently uh, Willem Dafoe improvised that because his idea was that Elias is like, knows he's fucked he's dying and this is like his last ditch effort like it's a, it's a ridiculous idea to think about in your head but as you're dying yeah. he says in his head he's literally reaching for the helicopter like yeah. he's just trying to get there, and that was his idea of putting his hands. It's not a Jesus thing. It's not like I'm being no. crucified for your sins kind of thing. But I, I can get how that's the reading of it. But that's not that's not what they put into it. I see that, and and you know what? That didn't occur to me. I didn't see it as a, as an allegory for crucifixion at all. It didn't occur to me. Yeah, I could see again, but I can see why people would think that now that you've explained it to me. But that did not occur to me at all. But I think I think also just the way he's presented as so good and pure kind of helps mm. too like what we we should talk about the the drug tent <laughs> sure <laughs> which all the actors by the way uh decided to smoke weed before they shot that scene so they could get into character <laughs> but then they realized that on a film shoot um when they say okay we're gonna do this scene next it doesn't always mean in the next five minutes so they all <laughs> smoked weed and then by the time they started shooting they all felt like shit because they, yeah, they all fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, they were all just really tired and not high and just groggy. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, in this scene, um, Taylor goes into the tent with Elias' squad, and they're all just like they're smoking weed. They're smoking like probably opium. A couple of them in the background might be shooting heroin. Um, well, yeah, and there's a reference to that because they talk when Tony Todd's character somebody says to him like, "If you, you it's because you keep shooting that shit." Like, right. Talking about because he's just. He's one of these guys that does whatever. Oh. He's just yeah. And I should mention, I did mention uh, another actor, uh, Francesco Quinn, who plays a character named Ra. And there's a yes. scene where he literally reaches into a Viet Cong soldier's pocket and takes heroin and puts it in his pocket. Oh, that's what it was. He yeah. grabbed something. I didn't know if it was supposed to be cash or what. No, but... it was drugs. I only knew because I read it because I, I was also confused okay. to what that was. But yeah, so this this whole scene, it's a little homoerotic, right? Oh yeah. Well, they're all sweaty and shirtless, and they're partying, and there's no women there. But I think I think we're kind of saying something here. I, I mean, I it, I definitely get that feeling, especially from the way Willem Dafoe like looks at Charlie Sheen's character and kind of gives him a little wave when he comes in, and then offers him the uh, the shotgun, which is a very intimate thing, very phallic. Uh, because very phallic. Willem uh, Dafoe takes the weed smoke, blows it into the gun, which Sheen then yeah. inhales. Like he literally, yes. it's literally like when you, you know, uh, a French cigarette <laughs> when you, well, well that's, I, I don't know if it's because of this movie or because of Vietnam, but, but doing that, taking in like a hit and blowing it through a tube into somebody else's mouth is called a shotgun oh, okay. in weed culture. So again, I don't know if it comes from this movie or from maybe from Nam, but 
that's uh and and that shotgun scene is one of the things that really stuck out to me from because i saw this movie the last time i saw this movie was probably 15 or 20 years ago and that scene always stuck out to me i didn't remember much else but the scene of them doing the shotgun um also they have okay this is just a minor thing but it they i feel like they have to be smoking opium in this scene because and maybe in 1987 this wasn't as out there but like using white rabbit as a cue to just smoke weed feels like overkill it's like come on calm down calm down you're not fucking you're not going on an acid trip or anything you're just smoking a little fucking weed relax there's there's definitely other drugs going on here yeah because oh yeah clearly yeah well it just the yeah it's it's so it's so interesting too because they cut uh between this and Barnes's tent which is very like you know they're they're playing poker and uh, yeah. and they're drinking though, so it's it's interesting. Drinking and judging the other guys for having drug parties, <laughs> right? It's like you know they're having drugs and and they're drinking. So re- really, they're doing the same thing, just in a very just in a different way, I guess. It's also again just to go back to that moment of Tony Todd being accused of shooting up too much. I wonder if if like it seems like the movie is is maybe commenting that the drug use during the war was partially responsible for how fucking crazy it was. Mm. Um, now, again, to be fair, to be fair. Uh, we go back to World War II. It wasn't like these guys were teetotalers. I mean, they were drinking, they were smoking, they were they were taking fucking. I mean, especially the Germans were taking pervetin, which is methamphetamine uh, uh, stimulants. I mean, drugs have been a part of war since the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, you're going asked to go put your life on the line. It does help to be fucked up to do it. But you wonder if these guys being whacked out on fucking heroin or, or opiates. Like they just don't give a fuck. They're just happy to do whatever. They don't. It, they don't think about it until they're not high, and that's why a lot of those guys stayed high after the war. Well, and I think I mean Oliver Stone also very well documented. And he's very open about his troubled past with drugs. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he had said that he wrote. I mean, fa- famously, he said he wrote Scarface as his farewell to cocaine. Right. Like that was his. <laughs> that was his thing. He's like he he finally got off coke and he wrote Scarface <laughs> right at the same time. A, I guess that's a good way to close. That's a good way, especially with the end scene of that movie. Yeah, that's a good way to close your cocaine days. Yeah, and that was in ni- like nineteen eighty three. So he was it wasn't well, I mean, that far. And removed. cocaine was kind of going out of style at the time. Right, but I think <laughs> I I mean just knowing that and and knowing that you know he was in Vietnam, I'm sure he has a, he had a lot of experience with this culture as well and doing drugs. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if he did heroin or whatever, but I'm I'm sure he did coke. I'm sure he smoked weed. I'm sure he drank. Like, you know, this is a, mm-hmm. this is a guy who knows what he's talking about here. So, yeah. I'm assuming this drug tent scene is not far removed from reality of something that he may have no. seen. <laughs> Well, and you think about, like, I go back to, to Bunny for a sec when he says, I love it over here because I can just do whatever the fuck I want and nobody gives me shit about it. And, I mean, yeah, kind of. <laughs> and it also... To some extent. I mean, these because these guys are not, like, these guys are usually on their own. They're not, they don't have a commander lording over them other yeah. than their lieutenant. And this lieutenant, by the way, not exactly the strongest lieutenant. He kind of is, is rolled by Barnes. I, I really like the inclusion of that lieutenant, too, because he's so fresh-faced. Like, I think Oliver Stone intentionally mm. makes him look so young and so inexperienced that he gets, like, batted around by Barnes, like, like so easily. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing. For an officer, a new officer like that, you have to have an implicit trust in your sergeant your because he's your guy. He's your guy that yeah. knows the squad. He is the guy that puts your orders into effect. Um, he is a guy that's going to save your ass because generally sergeants, especially, you know, green lieutenants usually get stuck with senior sergeants because they know their shit and they're going to teach them. But it's like, this guy's so green. He's like, uh, I think it would be better if when we're in front of the men, I give the orders and and Behringer's just like, whatever. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, doesn't give a fuck. No, he doesn't. Well, okay. And Jason, what year did, did they, did the U S enter Vietnam? Was it 65? 19. 1965, I believe, yes, okay. they took over for the French. Now, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but the 60s was very much the decade of the hippies, right? Where that really started, sure. the yeah. counterculture on the rise mm-hmm. and everything. So I would assume you had a lot of hippies in the war, at first, at least. Well, certainly when you started drafting people, yes, yeah. you would get more of those. Although, I don't know, I mean, outside of um, 
Like, there's nobody really in the unit, I think, that could be considered a hippie, well, per se. Well, no, but I'm just, I just mean, like, I, I get more of that vibe when they're all, like, smoking up and, and doing their thing, mm. is that a lot of them seem like they're, they, they might, they may fall in that camp if they were back home, kind of thing. Yes. Yes, they, they definitely are, are people that would embrace the counterculture of the 60s. Like, Sheen is, is very much playing a square, which is hilarious yes. to think about now. Um, I know he's so he's so fresh faced and innocent. Yeah, <laughs> but like it's and then and because when he goes into that tent, he's very uncomfortable at first, and eventually he gets into yeah. it and everything. But um, it, it... Well, the first thing they give him is a hit of opium. So yeah, <laughs> no wonder he's feeling good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, and and just the other thing too. I mentioned like the homoeroticism. I mean, the gun is one thing. Also, when you first see Elias in that scene, he's literally laying shirtless, eating a banana. Like, come yeah. on, <laughs> <laughs> come on. <laughs> But it's almost remake this movie, uh, uh, Oliver Stone, and be brave and give us the the relationship between Elias and uh, Chris that we've always wanted. But maybe it's also like a, just a more honest uh, type of male bonding because they're, they're yeah. like they're kind of stripping away that like fake bravado, right? You see in the yeah. other tent, you see that very much. It's so funny because you see this phallic imagery and this like homoeroticism. Cut to John C. McGinley in the other tent talking the, talking it up about him like killing someone or 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 beating someone up and he's like, oh, you should have seen the bullets coming. Yeah. Cut back to Willem Dafoe eating a banana. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. very, yeah, very exactly. different. There's a lot of big difference there. And, uh, but McGinley's such a great suck ass in this movie. He's just always sucking at, up to Berenger, I think, because he just wants to go home. And there's so much more uh, to his character too, though, because the, yeah. later on he starts to say like, you know, hey, I could use a few days and Berenger's like, no, 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 we need you. You know, we yeah, need no. you. And I think he, I, he doesn't turn on Berenger for sure. But I feel like if Barnes had survived later on, later in the movie, I think you'd see McGinley switch because he starts to get more like, oh, what am I doing? He even yeah, and, I th- and he doesn't cross the line. I will say he's no. one of the he's the, he's like the only one I think on Barnes' squad who doesn't fully cross the line. He doesn't like shoot an innocent. He doesn't like try to rape someone. Like he's very much like he's even he's disturbed by Bunny. Like he's standing yeah. in the doorway, being like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. It, it, he's, yeah, he's very much all talk, is what I'm saying. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And and one of the most just crushing moments is at the end of the movie mm. when, after the battle, he's there and the commander comes up to him and he goes, how you doing, uh, O'Neill, or whatever his he's name O'Neill, is. And yeah. he's like, "Not." He's, I'm, I'm good, sir, or I'm good, commander, or whatever his rank, colonel or major or whatever. Uh, and he's like, good, you've got second squad. And he's just like, no, <laughs> fuck. I'm still here. Like I can't get out. Well, and he only like he sees everybody going home, and it's like, why couldn't I have gotten injured so I could go home? Like, well, and, and that's a, and he only survived by hiding under a pile of bodies. By the way, yeah. And and you mentioned that injury thing. There's a quick scene. I didn't realize what it was when it happened, but there's a guy who stabs his own leg, so he can get an injury oh, really? and go home. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, poor poor Depp gets killed very early on in a pretty brutal, uh, pretty nasty bit of business. D- takes a, takes a, it's a very Vin Diesel uh, early in the movie death for for Johnny Depp, like saving Private Ryan. You yes, know I, the I, letter. Come speaking on, speaking of deaths, man. The some of the scenes in this movie, I like when they come upon the Vietnamese camp, and uh, it's like they, it's clear that they must have just evacuated. Like there's still a smoking cigarette on the ground. Yeah, and then and it's so tense because it's all quiet and everything, and they're looking around, and then the buddy finds the maps, mm-hmm. and of course under the ammo can the maps are in is in a mine, and when he picks up the can, boom, blows up the whole camp and kills a couple guys, and it's just chaos. And and speaking of the deaths too, I think it's interesting that like. There isn't, other than Defoe, who obviously gets that long scene of him being shot and everything, most of the death scenes, even the important ones, are very quick. Like, very quick yeah. and nasty. Like, Bunny gets shot in the mouth by a shotgun. Uh, uh, yeah. every, the only, and there's very few survivors. I think the only people who survive this movie are Keith David, because he actually gets to leave early. <laughs> He, he leaves early and he's somehow all intact. And he's like, goodbye, <laughs> motherfuckers, like, as you yep. would. And obviously, as Keith David would absolutely say when leaving any room, <laughs> goodbye, motherfuckers. <laughs> and O'Neill, who, when we learn of his predicament, like you said, he's pretty much not, he's probably not long for this world. And mm-hmm. Taylor, like Charlie Sheen, those are the only people that survive, of the characters that we see, those are really the only people that survive the movie, the main characters. Yeah. Um, 
but it like it, even even Barnes. So even like you know once Taylor's not stupid, he knows that Barnes probably killed Elias or at least indirectly. No, he knows. Yeah, like it, he knows because he, because he saw him in the jungle. He said, "Where's Elias?" And Barnes is like, "He's dead." He's like, "Where is he?" He's about a hundred meters back. We gotta go. Let's go. And then they go. And then as they're leaving, then they see Elias running out of the woods. Right. And he's like, oh, so he told me he was dead and he's not dead. And he looked at him and he's like, the eyes, man, the eyes, you know it when you see it in a man's eyes. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. So then he pretty much like puts in his head, I got to kill. I'm going to kill Barnes. I'm going to fucking kill Barnes. And they even have that meeting where they're all talking about how they're going to, they, they're going to deal yeah. with him. And, and fucking Barnes walks right into the middle of that unarmed. I, I think he was there the whole time. I literally think he was just sitting there drinking whiskey, listening to them the whole time and then decided to reveal himself and, and <laughs> unarmed and telling them like, yeah, unarmed. do it. Like you probably get away with it too. And then, and then, you know, knowing in his head that none of them could do, could do what he could do. And then, there's that moment where where Sheen tackles him, and I think just in that brief moment, Barnes is like, "Okay, he might, he might cross the line. Like he might have the potential to cross the line." But then, like I was, what I was getting to is that when Barnes eventually does get killed by Taylor, even that moment's very quick. It's not like a drawn yes. out like, "You're not gonna shoot me because you can't shoot me. You're a good soldier boy." He just looks at him and says, "What?" And then he just fucking kills him like immediately. No, he says he goes, "Do it," oh, and he right, does right, it. Right. It's like a comedy beat almost. He's like, do it. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. And he's dead. And it's and it's also it's um the exact same shot uh when Barnes kills a Viet Cong soldier earlier. Like the exact same uh, shot, exact same amount of gun bullets. They go in the same place on his body. It's to the to the T. Neat. It is neat. Um I wonder too, like, I mean, obviously there's lots of reasons why the US Army wouldn't support this movie. But I'm wondering if the officers being fra- not officers, but the sergeants being fragged which is the term for killing your own officers or killing your own guys, um, if that was one of the main things oh. that would keep them from being involved. Oh, I, the idea, I mean, how many war movies you see where soldiers actually frag an officer? Well, that's not, or a sergeant. Well, that's what I was wondering because, I, like I said, Apocalypse Now came out before this, and they show the atrocities of war in that movie. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, but they don't necessarily show soldiers turning on each other. They show that no. Marlon Brando, you know, his character get uh, has been brainwashed and and gone crazy but he you certainly don't see like brando uh <laughs> turning around and fragging you know his sergeant it's very different no. where in this movie yeah you see them like it, it's civil war within the unit and i don't think the american military wants to be like yeah yeah join the army be careful though you might have to kill your sergeant like well, and of course, a real-life example, I don't know that it's ever been proven necessarily, but I don't know if you're familiar with Pat Tillman, who was the um, football player who went to Afghanistan in 2001, and he died there, was celebrated as a hero, and then it came out that he was killed by friendly fire. There's some thought that he may have been fragged by his own men. Okay. Does anybody know why? Yeah. Because uh, well, I don't think Pat Tillman, I think Pat Tillman quickly realized that the war wasn't wasn't super good, and he wasn't excited about it, and uh, was talking shit i think that may have been something like that oh, wow yeah okay yeah i think i saw something about an investigation or something and and, and people mm-hmm. wanting to open up a better investigation about that i think well, especially because he's a guy whose image has been abused by pro-war people yes. when he clearly was a guy that was anti-war not was was uh, certainly by the time he was dead was against the war yeah. was not in on it somebody, um, somebody also an atheist as i understand which is kind of cool <laughs> which which i'm sure conservatives don't mention that part no no certainly not um what are your feelings on i do want to ask a couple more things before we uh, take a break here what are your feelings on the voiceover because it kind of comes in at the beginning you hear it like s- sort of sporadically and then it comes in again really strongly at the end by Charlie Sheen. You know, it's fine it's fine i think it it works um i like the conceit of what I really like is the conceit of him sending messages, like messages, <laughs> sending letters with, with a pen, sending letters to his grandmother, not his parents, but his grandmother. Mm-hmm. And he does that for the first bit of the movie and then it stops because I don't think he wants to send her letters because he doesn't want to have to tell her anything yeah. about what's happening. He probably can't because they'd probably censor it. But yeah, that's an interesting, ch- that's and then true. yes, the vo- voiceover comes back in. I mean, I think that's again Oliver Stone kind of coming through and and just relating his own experience. Oh yeah, this, he's very much uh, a stand-in for Stone, one hundred percent. I mean, he's even said that. Oh, yeah. 
um, about this care about this character. Yeah, no, I never thought about that. I just because I thought I thought while I was watching it, I was like, it feels a bit overwrought. I don't know why they kind of give up on it and then bring it back, but that does make more sense because the voiceovers are him are his letters that he's writing. So it does make sense that when yeah. certainly when the village gets wiped out, he's like, hey, Grams, uh, killed a bunch of innocent civilians today. It was wild. You should have yeah. seen their head go. Watched a girl get raped. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't think you'd be writing that to your grandma, and he probably doesn't <laughs> want to like make up stuff. So, um, yeah. But, uh, okay, and then the last thing I want to, because this was a thing that actually came under fire a little bit from some groups when the movie came out. Um, some people accused uh, Oliver Stone of stereotyping the, 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 the black characters in this movie, the ones like you know, Forrest Whitaker, Keith David, Tony Todd. And I read something that they said they're all portrayed as cowards, but I don't know that I saw that. I don't think that I know the 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 Re- Reginald or Reggie Johnson's character is getting pretty fucking, you know, uh, out of it by the end. Yeah. You know, when his, when his feet are when his feet are all fucked up and they're gonna put a caterpillar in his junk. Like I, I wouldn't say he's coward, but he's just yeah. Well, I mean, and he's the one that uh, runs at the end, right? When when he's in the the hole with Bunny. I believe so. Yes, yeah. I think so. Which, which, which yeah. if that's the example they're going to point out, I mean, you also have McGinley who literally hides for the entire battle. Yeah. Hides under a pile of bodies, which, again, in war, as, as they say in the movie, in war, there are no cowards. And, like, you do what you got to do to live and, and, and if, fight another day. Yeah, and if they're going to use the example of Keith David, like, getting away, it's like, well, he, just, he got to go home. I mean, he's he, not, he's not he, being well, a I wouldn't, coward. None of them would have stuck around. Maybe maybe Barnes would have, but none of them would have fucking stuck around, I think, at that point. It wasn't like World War II. It was, uh, you know, they were willing to get the fuck out of there because it was just awful. Oh, if, if, if Taylor had not killed Barnes, Barnes would just die there by some other means. I'm sure. I'm sure of it. He, oh, no doubt. He'd go back and he'd see a bunch of cereal. He'd be even angrier than Jeremy Renner. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's, no, I think he was a guy with a death wish, ultimately. I think he was a guy that um, knew he wasn't going to make it out of Vietnam and he was going to do his job how he saw fit and fuck the world. Uh, yeah. But yeah, a man that had done so much terrible shit that, yeah, I don't think his plan was to get out at all. Yeah. All right, well, Jason, uh, is there any other big things you want to discuss before we go into our bits and our bombs? Nope, we're good to go. All right, well, uh, we're going to take a brief break then, and uh, we will be right back. Hey, this is Charlie Sheen, Age of Radio. Check it out. Something happening in here, and what it is ain't exactly clear. We got bits and bombs over here. And Brendan and Jason are sitting over there. We got to stop. Hey, bits and bombs. Everybody's reading their bits and bombs. Action. We set it up front. I'll just reiterate. Stacked fucking cast. Not a lady in sight. Not one. Oh, wait, no. There is one. The old woman in the village. Right, right. Okay, yes, and and yes. So the does this civilians. does this pass the Bechdel test, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I I assume those women were talking about stuff that wasn't just about other men. So sure. <laughs> um, I don't think she talks with another woman, so I think it already already fails. <laughs> um, rejoice, oh young man, in thy youth. That's the quote that the mm. movie opens up with, which I think is interesting. I, I wonder, if, like, a bunch of people going to see like a, a quote unquote kick ass war movie saw this and they were like, "What the fuck? I just want to see some shit blow up, man." It's just like, "Fuck it, I'm going out to rejoice. I'm done with this." Can movie. you imagine, like, those like the macho guys that go to see this though in, in the '80s? I'm sure people, some people didn't know, and oh, yeah. they see the drug tent scene and they're just like, "What the fuck is this shit?" Or they're like, "Dude, that Vietnam's awesome." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They got all the drugs. <laughs> I feel like uh, Oliver North seeing this movie being like, mm-mm, ban it. I wonder if um, Tom Berenger's face was was fucked up, like like he was given so many scars because they tried to make him look more evil than Willem Dafoe. Oh, I'm sure, because Dafoe doesn't, <laughs> that is, like we said many times in this episode, these words, but Dafoe is fresh-faced. Fresh-faced, yes, absolutely. A young, young um, virile Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Uh, Interestingly, um, Chris points out that uh, at one point in his uh, voiceover about that these the guys he's serving with, they're the end of line guys. They're poor. They're unwanted. They're the usual shit. They're the poor people that do all the fighting for the rich people. Mm-hmm. 
And at one point, he's like, I just, they're like, why'd you join up? You don't seem like uh, you need to be here. You seem like a pretty rich guy, or you seem like a rich boy or something. And he's like, look, I, I, the poor shouldn't be the only ones to fight this war. You know, the rich people should have to do it too. And he's like, boy, that's even that's a rich guy's opinion right there. That's a rich guy thing. <laughs> but I get his point too. He's just like, you know, I, I don't feel yeah. like they should be fighting for me only yeah. he wants to do his part that, he's again like wanting maybe trying to prove some manliness perhaps or just because he feels guilty but he wants to be there to do his part and not just leave it to the leave it to the poor well and that could be stone reckoning with himself too because i'm sure he had you know a decent upbringing and maybe that's him being like you know this is why i went because i felt like i also needed to serve it shouldn't just be the people who absolutely need to because there's nothing else in their lives Mm -hmm. um jason i want to also want to point out um it's not just the enemy they're fighting in this movie they do they do make a point of showing like you know the ants the the dysentery yeah. just the jungle itself yeah. and the weather are, are things yes. that affect them like their forefathers in the pacific campaign uh, uh they got to know the joys of jungle warfare mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our, perhaps our sloppiest war yeah one of them uh, speaking of sloppy, uh, one of the lines I really like is when they're talking about, I think, I think Bunny's like, I'm, I'm going to get me some pussy. And then, and then the buddy's like, only pussy you get is going to be willed to you. Ah. <laughs> it's just such a funny line. This line, again, this movie is full of so many great lines, but not like, again, not quite to a predator level. They do feel genuine, but it's a lot of macho bullshit and it's entertaining. I know we talked about how great Behringer and Defoe are, but what do you think, like, in comparison to, like, Charlie Sheen's performance? Like, I feel like... He's 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 good, but like it's hard to stand out with those two. <laughs> he's he he's has to be the everyman that anchors the movie, right? He's the guy whose perspective we're seeing. He can't be too out there. Um, and in that way, Charlie Sheen is great. I mean, he does the job. Yeah. I mean, but he doesn't need to do much more than kind of be himself in that position and and react how he might react. I was impressed that watching um, it now, I didn't uh, get distracted because every time I see Charlie Sheen, most of the time, I think of like parody movies. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I'm impressed with myself. I'm gonna give myself a round of applause. Um, you forget that the guy's a really good actor. I already mentioned the booby trapping the maps, but there's a lot of cruelty in this movie. And one of the crueler things that is done is they have a, a hole they got to clear out. Now, normally you would toss a grenade down in a hole, but that's not good enough for Tom Berenger. Tom Berenger gets out the Willie Peter, the white phosphorus, Brendan. I think we've talked about white phosphorus before. White phosphorus is a chemical substance that is extremely good at lighting up battlefields. They use it to, they shoot it into the sky and it just burns like a motherfucker and it lights up a battlefield, right? Um, but also a super effective weapon that is, I believe, banned by the Geneva Convention because of its cruelty. And old Tom Berenger takes a whiskey peter, he pops it and he tosses it in the hole and uses that to clear out the hole. And that is insane because that stuff just burns and burns and burns mm -hmm. and there's no escape for those people in that hole that is a horrible terrible just excruciating death so what you're saying is it was cruel very cruel. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. speaking of cruel uh, um i like how at first when they enter the village taylor is not i think what i like about charlie sheen's character too is he's not portrayed as like a squeaky clean totally free of scrutiny soldier either like when he goes no. to the village he's very aggressive towards that that kid oh, yeah. that oh, oh yeah he gets in that kid's face he's screaming at him he's yelling he at him, him he's like snapping he's, he's telling him but, he's, but eventually pulls back. is he not telling him to stop smiling too which he keeps yes. saying which clearly that's not what's happening but he's just so enraged clearly that's just the guy's face yeah, yeah he's just so enraged by the idea that they that that the Viet Cong killed their buddy and strung him up on a tree to you know piss them off i guess and he's just so enraged by that that he's like everybody in this village is against us like everybody's got something to do with that um and he's just a blind rage yeah, everybody what's well, like that line in apocalypse now which we'll get to eventually he says how do you tell if they're vc well if they run they're vc if they don't run they're well disciplined vc yeah that's that's horrifying so shoot how do you shoot women and children you lead them a little less Another great, again, Keith David, so many great lines, but the one that sticks out to me and that I hope that I use it in my life is keep your pecker hard and your powder dry and the world will turn for you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that Oliver Stone isn't afraid to show the soldiers getting emotional and crying. You don't see mm. that a lot in uh, movies that uh, take place entirely in battle. Like, uh, I guess you see it sometimes more if, if like as like, you know, the more modern movies maybe, but certainly mm. not 
older ones because you know they're very battle worn and they're hard and they're yeah. and they're tough men and certainly that would never happen but i like how oliver stone is not above showing that at all even even barnes there's a scene where charlie sheen catches him by the fire and you can tell that his eyes are teared up because yeah. he's just been through some shit and he's trying to deal with it and he's not happy that sheen sees him sitting no there. and he clearly pushes it down every time yeah yeah doesn't doesn't address it just pushes it down and keeps going uh, there's also uh, nothing heroic about the way they had to kill some of these Viet Cong soldiers. I mean, like, you're seeing, like, gun butts to the head. You're seeing, like, mm -hmm. just uh, random uh, horrible gunshots. People are stabbed and kicked and everything. Like, it's very... It's it's such a fucked up environment because you can't see anything. Like, yeah. you, you, especially if you're, fight, if you're fighting at night. Like, the only thing you're going to see is, like, the fucking... The... Uh, the muzzle flashes right so by the time you are like to, you can see someone you're in their face and it turns into like world war one shit like trench trench shovels and fucking bayonets and stuff like yeah we see people getting actually bayoneted yeah which which you'd think that's a like a world war one world war two thing um uh, knife is always useful in war. my my only other note uh, my only other bit, bit and or bomb, Jason, is the some of the closing dialogue where uh, Taylor refers to Barnes and Elias as two fathers, his two fathers during the war, which yeah. is like it's very, so interesting because they almost represent two very, you know, they obviously represent two very different think methods of thinking, I guess, or, or, yes. or two very different kinds of soldiers. And and at the time that he says this, Jason, he's wearing the headband of the uh, bandana like Elias and he's also got mm. a wound on his cheek very similar to Barnes. Yes, cuz well the one that Barnes gave him. Well, that been a mean similar to the one that Barnes had though. So it's like it's it's oh. almost like, you know, and he says I have two fathers. It's almost like he took a little bit of both yeah. of them with him. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no. You uh, yeah, he, he's a guy that has been forged in the fires of these two sergeants. Mm -hmm. For better or for worse. Um I just want to mention this because I want to talk about this movie's budget. There's a we, we have a scene where they get some air support and we have a scene of a plane coming in and it looks really shitty. And that's okay. Because this movie would cost like six million bucks. It was not uh, an expensive movie. And when you look at the movie, like they managed to do so much with so little. Like I think the biggest things they have is they have a helicopter, at least one helicopter, and they have one APC. And they use that stuff and then the equipment and uniforms and everything like they they make do with what they have but it's a pretty small scale which makes sense for vietnam because you know it wasn't like massive groups of soldiers uh clashing with other massive groups of soldiers it was small clashes like this mm -hmm. um but yeah props to oliver stone for making this fucking movie on a on a on that budget well, that's six million dollars because impressive. like we said the military is not going to help with that so this is very much a movie that he had to scrounge for to make so, yes, as as they point out, like Hollywood being so excited about this movie that it wins the Academy Award. But it's like, yeah, where was Hollywood when they wanted money to make the movie? They weren't there. They had to go to foreign investment. No, they're just there to reap the benefits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought it was ironic that Charlie Sheen gets saved by napalm. People don't often get saved by napalm. Uh, <laughs> and the last thing I have to say, well, two last things. One, when he frags, uh, when he frags uh, Barnes, he's smarter than Barnes. Because Barnes shot Elias with a, an M16. So theoretically, if they found his body, they'd find M16 bullets in it and know that it probably wasn't a Viet Cong soldier that shot him. It'd probably be his own guys. Conversely, when Charlie Sheen goes to shoot uh, Barnes, uh, and I assume it's maybe a matter of convenience because he's just fucking you know, gone through a battle, he picks up an AK-47 and shoots him with that. So it's commie bullets in him. So good job, Chris. The last note I have, Brendan, I don't know if you noticed this, and I haven't looked it up. I meant to Google this to find out, but the APC that pulls in at the end of the movie looks like it has a Nazi flag flying from it. The APC? Yeah, the uh, armored personnel carrier. The the uh, Near the end of the movie, when they the, the APC pulls up into frame, and it's got a flag on it, and it looks like a Nazi flag. Now, it may be a different flag, and I just and maybe just has similar coloring, but <laughs> if it was like, wait, what? <laughs> Why would we have a Nazi flag? That doesn't make any sense. I'm going to have to Google that. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't notice that, but it's very possible. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm looking at it and it is a Nazi flag. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, let me see here. Um, it says there's a, this is on Reddit and there's one comment here. It says from an interview with Vietnam veteran and movie consultant Dale Dye by Atlantic Magazine. Dye is, yeah, we know he's the go-to military guy. 
Toward the end of Platoon, there's a bizarre scene where an American tank has a Nazi flag flying above it. Why would American soldiers in Vietnam have a Nazi flag above their tank? Die. For the same reason that soldiers had flags with skull and crossbones image on it. We carried state flags as well. Atlantic. Did you see that when you were there? Die. Sure. But all that didn't mean much to us at 19. We were young, rebellious kids. We weren't making political statements. We we're making a military statement. We're stormtroopers. We'll tear your ass apart. We also put horrible graffiti on our helmets and flak jackets. Hmm. Okay. So okay, and and this and this made me think because there was an incident a few years back where uh, U.S. soldiers in uh, Afghanistan got caught flying a Nazi flag from their uh, uh, Hummer. Wow, the way Di is describing it sounds similar to how we talked about when we talk about British movies. We talk about the bands that uh, incorporated Nazi kind of uh, imagery or names into their na- into their band names sometimes. Yeah. Well, but they did that as a way to piss people off. These guys are doing it as as like a macho posture. But, but what I mean say. is like that they weren't necessarily doing it for the for the you know the atrocity side of it. They were doing it for different reasons. No. That's that's what I mean. Yes, they they yeah for sure. It's uh it's it's like them writing shit on their helmets. It's yeah. it's their little act of rebellion. Maybe trying to make themselves seem more badass than they are. Maybe trying to like I don't know uh, uh, piss off the enemy or something. But mm-hmm. who knows. It's just very strange to see a Nazi flag show up on a on a, an American APC. Yeah, not something you see every day. Nope. But that's that's all I have there, Brendan. All right. Well, Jason, there's a lot about there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes here, obviously, um, for this movie. But Oliver Stone started thinking about this movie basically after his tour of duty ended in 1968. <laughs> he started. Mm-hmm. He wrote a screenplay called Break. Which was like a, you know, it was a semi autobiographical account to de- detail his experiences with his parents and his time in the Vietnam War. Um, it was never produced, obviously, but he used it as the basis for Platoon. He actually, um, when he wrote a, a script, um, he actually set, in his head he set it to music from The Doors, and he sent it to Jim Morrison in the hope that Jim Morrison would play the lead. This was in 1968. So and okay. apparently Jim Morrison, um, it was said that when he died, he had the screenplay with him. Like he was reading it, he was interested. So unfortunately, that never happened. Um, so obviously Oliver Stone, he can't make this movie. He gets like studio interest a little bit, but you know there's not enough money to make this. Uh, he ends up uh, he ends up almost getting Sidney Lumet to make the movie with Al Pacino to star in it, but then that doesn't happen. Um, eventually Oliver Stone writes the screenplay for Midnight Express, which is a pretty big hit, um, and, and a critical hit too, but still studios reluctant to finance Platoon because it was about the Vietnam war. And in that time, cause Midnight Express came out in 78, uh, studios were not eager to write about no. the Vietnam war, which is, I mean, it's, uh, easy to say, uh, it's fair to say the least popular war, maybe <laughs> at the time. Yeah, it was, a, and it was a war that was only three years over, and it was a war that went on for far too long. It was, yeah. you know, they were in what sixty-five to seventy-five, I think, so a decade. I mean, it's no Afghanistan, but they were there, and they lost. <laughs> That's the thing. I, I looked into it one time. The a total Iraq war casualties, like deaths of the United States troops, was like about five thousand. Vietnam was a hundred thousand. Yeah, there you go. Um, so after another thing that the studios would do is after the because the deer hunter had come out, Apocalypse Now had come out, and they would say, you know, uh, these are the pinnacle of the Vietnam War era movies. I don't think we need to do say anything else. I mean, I think we've gotten it. Uh, we don't need to make Platoon. Um, so Oliver Stone responded by making a low budget movie. He made a horror movie called The Hand. Uh, it <laughs> did te- it did terrible. It failed at the box office. It was a flop. And he said, okay, I don't think this is ever going to get made. He co wrote a movie called Year of the Dragon for uh, a less a lesser fee and i'm sure you know the producer uh you heard of the producer dino de Laurentiis. Sure. he basically told dino de Laurentiis, he said if you produce platoon for me and help me get this made i'll write this movie for way less than i would usually get paid you get paid like two hundred thousand dollars to write year of the dragon which is still hmm. a decent chunk of money I mean, it's good money but, but you know um the movie was also directed by michael Cim- uh Cimino, or Cimino, who was his, of Deer Hunter fame. Yeah, who was also his friend. Um, so Shemina also tried to help produce Platoon in 1984. They couldn't find a distributor. That was the other thing. So <laughs> I don't know that Michael Chimino was a guy you wanted to have on your side after Heaven's Gate. Well, the Heaven's Gate hadn't, I don't believe, uh, well, hey, yeah, Heaven's Gate had been done for about four years, though. So he was starting to come back. Year of the Dragon was okay. after that. So he, he, had, he had come back, and that movie was somewhat successful. 
Um, but yeah, so D- 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 Laurentis had sent Oliver Stone basically to the Philippines to scout for locations. Um, and basically was like, I'm going to, I'm going to keep control of this script until you pay me back for this, vi- for this visit to the Philippines. <laughs> so, um, eventually, and in the meantime, eventually he had written, uh, Salvador, which is another movie that's, we're actually going to talk about at some point. Um, about El Salvador, of course. Uh, he tried to get James Woods to be in Platoon, and James Woods was like, "You know what? I you're my friend, Oliver, but I I can't go into another jungle with you." <laughs> He's just like, I, "I can't do it." Uh, Denzel Washington almost played Elias, uh, and Mickey Rourke, Emilio Estevez, who I think would have been god awfully miscast. And Kevin Costner were all considered for the part of Barnes. Um, Would have been interesting to see Kevin Costner play that role. Costner turned it down because his brother was in Vietnam and he didn't feel like it was uh, a good move to play this kind of crazy sergeant. He said he felt a little weird about it. He also said, this is crazy, (laughs) knowing the movies he's just recently been very successful in. Keanu Reeves turned down the role of Taylor because he, he, uh, he said it was too violent for him. (laughs) um and then apparently charlie sheen the reason he got the role of taylor was because of willem dafoe's approval um oh one last casting note is that john crier auditioned for the role of bunny how weird would that have been to look back (laughs) see ducky fucking going nuts (laughs) i don't know that he would have played ducky if he had done that movie yeah maybe not Well, actually pretty pink (laughs) pretty pink might have come out before that i think it was in 84 um Anyway, uh, a lot of Vietnamese refugees living in the Philippines at the time were recruited to act in different roles in the movie. Uh, they actually started shooting in the movie uh, two days after the after Ferdinand Marcos fled the country. So, <laughs> well, <hey. laughs> so they didn't. Nothing was delayed. They were scheduled to shoot. the The upheaval was happening, and Marcos fled the country. And two days later, shooting commenced as scheduled. And this is the crazy thing. And I think this actually helps the movie a lot. Filming was done chronologically, so it's oh. very rare that that happens, of course, uh, in a movie, yeah. as we as we know. But, yeah, they did all the scenes in order um, when they shot the movie. And, of course, you know, the big thing about this movie is that he put the actors through hell. He put them through boot camp with Dale Dye, mm-hmm. who is a Vietnam War veteran. Um, he works on tons of movies. I believe he's still oh, yeah. alive. Oh yeah. yeah, he's still alive. He's still. I think he still does it to some extent. He's in Band of Brothers, among yeah. other things, like... If there was a, a Hollywood war movie made in the last 30 years, there's a good chance that Dale Dye worked as a technical he, advisor. A technical advisor and probably in it, too. Yeah, um, usually shows up in a small role. And what I like about Dale Dye is he's a veteran that doesn't uh, talk about politics. Because <laughs> usually that doesn't end <laughs> up good. Um, sometimes. Anyway, he led the principal actors through a 30-day military-style training regimen. Uh, they basically limited their food and water. They fired blanks while they were sleeping to keep uh, sporadically to keep them awake. Um, Stone just wanted to mess with everyone's heads. Uh, Willem Dafoe said, you know, the training was very important to the making of the movie. Uh, he said, by the time you got through the training and through the film, you had a relationship to your weapon. It wasn't going to kill people, but you felt comfortable holding it. So you didn't just look like an idiot holding a gun. I will say though, this is just me talking for a second. I think this is a little much. I think putting people through this training idea is is good i get it i get you want some realistic shit but to me this is that method acting thing that i hate that Mm. that people do so much that i fucking hate you need to let actors fucking act sure sure Uh, if you tried acting my dear boy as Lawrence olivier once right if like Um, people people on the other side of the pond do this shit for the most part without this nonsense like it 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 just it says to me i get i get the thinking behind it but it i think you have to draw the line at abusing people like i think that's too much sure i I would argue though there's there is some value in it uh if nothing else then the the trauma bonding that then occurs between the actors that they become bonded in a way that is similar to soldiers and i imagine that would reflect in the performance sure but you can Uh, still act that yeah for sure. Like you but I mean I wonder how many of these guys that were in this movie are still buddies because of this movie. Yeah, I just yeah. It it's it feels very Kubrick and Shelley Duvall to me. Yeah, I mean why abuse actors if you don't have to? Is this just a power thing on some director's parts? <laughs> yeah, and apparently Oliver Stone was a little was a little rough while they were shooting the movie too. Apparently Johnny Depp 
did a take and just vomited and Oliver Stone just stood there waiting and said, okay, you ready for a second take? Like stuff like that. Like just, yeah, I can, the, the guy was in Vietnam. I'm sure he, <laughs> he, I, yeah, he's like, come I, on, I, <laughs> pull it together. Yeah. I feel like there was a lot of like, oh, come on, you pussies. I was there for real type thing. Yeah. These, these fucking namby pamby actors. <laughs> yeah. Um, can't handle getting shot at like a good human right. being. Uh, there was a novelization of the script written by Dale Dye that was published. I thought oh. that was interesting. And Weird. there is a video game based on this movie, which I have not played or seen, but I can only assume misses the point of the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, there's a Platoon video game from 1987, and there is a Platoon video game from 2002. Yeah, I'm sure uh, they're both awful. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I just have some, uh, some bits of trivia here for you, Jason. Um as of 2016, because this is when this was written, uh, Oliver Stone is the last veteran of any war to win an Oscar for Best Director other than Clint Eastwood. Um, the uh, the Vietnamese child that Kevin Dillon and Charlie Sheen shoot at had cataracts, but his family was too poor to pay for treatment. Uh, so apparently Kevin Dillon and Charlie Sheen felt so bad about this that they pooled their money together and paid for a surgery. Aw, that's a nice. nice ending to that, right? Um. According to John C. McGinley, everyone hated Oliver Stone for the entire duration of the shoot. <laughs> and That doesn't surprise yeah, me. Yeah, and it was very much intentional. He wanted them to hate him. Uh, and they said, you know, he, they said that his behavior sometimes bordered on psychotic. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and, but the thing is, like, it's not, it wasn't just method, because apparently he treated the editor poorly. Like, like, like the, the fucking editor of the movie is not going through the, uh, you know... <laughs> The, the military training camp. Apparently, the editor claimed that one day Stone yelled at him for taking away footage of a scene that they hadn't even shot yet, because um, he was so, <laughs> yeah, he was just so like out of out of his mind. Um, there's a point in the movie where a character uh, is warned not to drink from a river because he might get malaria. Well, apparently, during filming, filming, uh, Willem Dafoe got thirsty and drank water from a river not knowing that a dead pig was uh, upstream and he was sick for about 24 Ooh. hours, but thankfully did not get malaria. Ugh, um, yuck. There's a quote from Roger Ebert. He said, Francois Truffaut once said that it was impossible to make an anti-war film, that the, attack, the act of depicting war glorified it and ended up making it look like fun. I wish he had lived to see Platoon. Here is a movie shot at the ground level from the infantryman's point of view, and it does not make war look like fun. Um some of the fun stuff, uh, speaking of fun, some of the stuff that's written on some of their helmets, uh, Charlie Sheen's, it says, when I die, bury me upside down so the world can kiss my ass. Uh, yeah. Johnny Depp's helmet says Sherilyn, which is a tribute to Sherilyn Fenn, who he was actually dating at the time. Okay. Um, Lieutenant Wolf, uh, which we, who we briefly mentioned, on his helmet a drawing of Alfred E. Newman and just says, what me worry? And apparently <laughs> nice, it just caused nice. Oliver Stone to just laugh hysterically every time he saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Stone, a real Mad Magazine fan, I guess. Yep. Uh, and, of course, this was then later perfected in uh, uh, Kubrick's uh, Full Metal Jacket when, I believe, Animal Mother's helmet just says, uh, kill them all. Oh, okay. Well, we'll <laughs> get to that one, too. Uh, Kevin Dillon was apparently was apparently really upset when they were filming the scene where he has to beat the boy to death because... Uh, he, he, the kid was actually deaf and blind in one eye and missing a leg. And he felt bad for him because he was a nervous wreck the whole time. And Kevin Dillon wasn't sure if he even knew that they were filming a movie. Uh, he said that, uh, it was so intense that, uh, he couldn't even like watch it back after he was like, he, he, it was, yeah. Apparently when, uh, I actually did notice this when you, when they're cleaning the latrines, you can hear good morning Vietnam on the radio. And that's indeed the guy for, you know, that good morning Vietnam is based on the actual dude. Yeah. Okay, because he does the good morning Vietnam. It's a, it's a recording of the real guy. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. There's so much trivia, Jason. I Just so much interesting stuff here. Val Kilmer auditioned <laughs> for the role of Elias, and apparently he gave such a bizarre audition where he portrayed the character as an Indian shaman. <laughs> because, of course, he did. It's Val Kilmer. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um um, Elias's death scene was supposed to have a lot more blood. There was packets of blood that he actually, if you look carefully, apparently he, um, he's holding something that's supposed to trigger the blood, but he dropped it by mistake. So we just get uh. that scene of him throwing his arms up and getting shot, but they liked it so much and they just left it as it is. Well, Brendan, I'll tell you, uh, having watched some, uh, combat video recently from the Ukraine war and watching some Ukrainians clear a Russian trench, 
it it looked like people getting shot. People getting shot don't explode into blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think they just yeah. I think they wanted it to be more than it was, but I think it was better yeah. without it. I th- I think it works perfectly. I think that they that that mistake works in its favor because I think it would almost be silly if there was blood shooting out of him when that was happening. Yeah. Um. There was an improvised moment from Charlie Sheen. Apparently, after he kills Barnes, um. And he drops a grenade. He quickly drops a grenade. And the the idea of it was Sheen said he thought his character would be suicidal at that point in the movie. And Stone was liked it and kept it in. Nice. Um, and that's it. I wanted to point out there was another moment that I think might have been improvised based on how it went. But it's just a nice little moment where uh, O'Neill goes to light, uh, burns a cigarette, and he pulls out a Zippo and he flicks it and it doesn't light. And then he looks over and realizes it and then lights it and then gets him to... Sm- it just... Yeah. It, it actually reminded me of the scene in um, uh, Four Rooms. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> a movie I've seen... I mean, nobody's hand got chopped off, but still. A movie I've seen once and only really remember Tim Roth chopping off a hand and walking away. <laughs> yes. that. Oh, that's a great scene. Uh, also, the movie that uh, brought us Spy Kids. What? Yeah, the first sequence in that movie is uh, Antonio Banderas and uh, an actress playing his wife, and they have two kids. I think they're like supposed to be spies or something, and oh. they have these two kids that get into trouble in the hotel, and that's basically the genesis of Spy Spy Game uh, Spy Kids because I believe that was the segment directed by Robert Rodriguez. <laughs> I thought you were going to say is the genesis of Spy Game. <laughs> Brad Pitt and Robert Redford. <laughs> Uh, the best movie that my political science teacher forced me to uh, watch. The mo- <laughs> the daddest movie that ever dadded. Dab dad movie, but good. Uh, Very good. I don't, I don't remember it a lot. <laughs> um, anyway, this movie has a Rotten Tomatoes rating of 89%. Um, Very, very well liked. Of course, the uh, consensus reads, Informed by director Oliver Stone's personal experiences in Vietnam, Platoon foregoes easy sermonizing in favor of a harrowing ground-level view of war, bolstered by no-holds-barred performances from Charlie Sheen and Willem Dafoe, and I would add Tom Berger to that. Uh, Roger Ebert gave it four out of four stars, calling it the best film of the year and the ninth best of the 1980s. Uh, Gene Siskel also gave it a perfect four out of four stars. They agreed, Jason. Um... Wow. Uh, and in the New York Times, uh, Vincent Canby said, Platoon is possibly the best work of any kind about the Vietnam War since Michael Hare's vigorous and hallucinatory book, Dispatches. Uh, Pauline Kael said, The film has been widely acclaimed, but some may feel that Stone takes too many melodramatic shortcuts and that there's too much filtered light, too much poetic license, and too, much, and too damn much romanticized insanity. The movie crowds you. It doesn't leave you room for an honest emotion. Of course, Pauline Kael... Uh, right there with the take that everybody will remember her for. Uh, <laughs> not a fan. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and then uh, the, the journalist I was talking about earlier about the portrayal of um, of black people in this movie named Wallace Terry, uh, who did actually go into Vietnam, uh, did criticize the movie for its depiction of African-American soldiers. I uh, called it a slap in the face and said uh, he noted that there, in the movie you, there's no black actors playing officers. And said the three notable black soldiers in the film all portrayed as cowards. And he went on to criticize it as perpetuating black stereotypes. And he said the film barely rises above the ages old Hollywood stereotypes of blacks as celluloid savages and people who do silly things. He doesn't say people, but I'm not saying the word that he says. Um, you know, it's funny because and maybe it's just because I'm a white yeah. guy, but I didn't get that from it. I didn't get I didn't see them as being cowards and. Uh, I thought it was nice that they had a, 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 at least a mix of people. But, yes, there probably should have been a black sergeant or something. Yeah. Like, it would have been nice to see a black fo- person in I – mean, um, it would have been nice – sorry. It would have been nice to see a black person in a position of authority. Yeah, and I mean I don't think it's like necessarily only a platoon issue. I think this is just an issue of representation, especially in the 80s, yes. right? Where it's like, okay, come yes. on, platoon, help out a little bit. <laughs> Like I get it. There are certain like like if you were showing a, a maybe a World War One movie, there probably wouldn't be very many black officers. Right. Uh, but Bad, there was certainly wouldn't be many black officers in the Civil there War. There was in the Grand Illusion. We had one. That's right, and he was a uh, what was he? he was a French officer yeah. though. Yeah, well, I guess I, sh- I should say Amer- among the American troops, you were, fi- were, were unlikely to find black officers. Right. Spoiler alert: We probably won't find it too much next week, but. Um, yeah. Jason, this movie goes to the Oscars. You goddamn right it does, and it's nominated for. There's three that it's nominated for that it doesn't win. Can you guess what those would be? 
did I don't think Berenger won for his acting. So he? Berenger and Defoe are both nominated for Best Supporting Actor, but the winner go is Michael Caine for Hannah and Her Sisters. Huh. There's two more. Uh, best Cinematography. Yes, and that goes to The Mission. Huh. And uh, Best Sound Editing? No, nope, Best Original Screenplay, and that also goes oh, to okay. Hannah and Her Sisters. <laughs> Um, the wins, though, it wins Best Editing, Best Sound, Best Director for Oliver Stone, and, of course, Best Picture. Hmm. Um, at the BAFTAs, it is nominated for Best Cinematography as well, but it, the winner that year is a movie that is near and dear to your heart, uh, Jean de Florette. Oh, love it. My favorite. Yep. Uh, and it does win for Best Director and Best Editing. Um, the budget, like you said, $6 million. Did you see what it made? Uh, I didn't notice. Uh, I assume it probably made what, like, hundred million? A hundred and thirty-eight million dollars box office. Damn, off a six. That's a solid return. Yeah, off a six million dollar budget. Even if you're talking about the marketing, if it's still like twenty million, that's still incredible. Um, a very, very, very successful movie. But Jason, I mean, I'm sure people could guess hearing our conversation. But was it successful in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, and in your body? Tell us. Yeah, I, well, I liked this movie when I saw it years ago, but watching it again, it's just so goddamn good. Like, it's so well made. It's it doesn't pull any punches. It's brutal. Uh, it's grounded. You know, uh, I, I I can understand why some people might think this insanity is romanticized. I don't feel that way. I feel like this movie is trying to show you just the total shit show that it was to be in Vietnam and experience that. And to go through that war- insanity of warfare in a way that you don't really see in World War II movies. Uh, uh, like, it, it's less less about the psychological. I guess more so on the Pacific front, but, yeah, it's 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 just so fucking good. Like, watching this movie, like, from minute 10, I was like, my God, I'm just compelled. And I just watched it straight through. Didn't even pause it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. It's on this list for a reason. I mean, it's number 10 on the list, on the 100 Greatest War Movies list. So, I mean... It's it's so nice to see a Best Picture winner that absolutely deserves to be Best Picture. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like they're less <laughs> common than the ones that you're like, Best Picture, really? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, and based on the other ones that were nominated, I mean, you know, Hannah and Her Sisters is probably great. I don't know if it's Best Picture. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I, haven't seen I I agree. I think Platoon is is a very 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 good movie. Um, obviously three, well two amazing supporting performances. One really solid lead performance and great supporting actors uh, throughout. Uh, the battle scenes are realistic and brutal, and he doesn't overdo it with the gore either. Like there there's moments, no. but it's not like it's not done to like gross you out. Like I feel like it, Hacksaw Ridge, they push it a little bit more. Oh yeah, but the, Hacksaw Ridge definitely has that Mel Gibson bump in the in the violence. But yeah, uh, yeah this one it, it's bad and it's gross and it's disturbing, but it's not like yeah, it's not. It never video feels game. like it's trying to shock you. I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, it does. Though. It does. It doesn't. It, try. it doesn't it feel like does. it's it's working over time to do it. Yeah, it's not. It's yeah, exactly. It's not putting in that extra. It just shows you what happened, and right. that's shocking enough. So yeah, so I probably wouldn't put it on the list. No, I'm just joking. of course, it, <laughs> it's gonna be on there. Um, oh, this will be on the list. Yeah, this 100%. is this is one of the definitive Vietnam movies. Exactly. I think anything in the top ten here is gonna have a pretty good chance of staying on this list because I mean they did they they seem to be the more like you said definitive uh, choices. But mm-hmm. we're gonna move on to something a little different next week. Jason, we're going back to 1945, and we're going back to, of course, our most common war on this list. We're going back to World War II, and we're going to talk about a little film directed by a friend of ours, Mr. Lewis Milestone, who directed All Quiet on the Western Front. It's a movie called A Walk in the Sun, starring Dana Andrews. Um, The notable thing about it I'll, I'll mention is a 1945 movie about a 1943 battle. Mm-hmm. An invasion of Italy. Do you know when in 1945 this movie was released? Uh, December 3rd. Okay, so this was the war was over by this point. And it's released, but certainly yeah. when they were filming it, I don't know. Yes. I imagine they were probably, yeah, probably still going through the final phases. Yeah. Crazy. So that, that should be interesting. And we don't see a lot of stuff, We or well, I certainly haven't seen a lot of stuff about Italy uh, 
outside of, I think, the English patient was maybe the only one we've watched that dealt with the Italian campaign. And what's going to top that? <laughs> it's, 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 a hard, it's hard, guys, but I think we might be able to do it next week. Well, Jason, just a little brief preview here. When a GI platoon lands on the beaches of Italy during World War II, the troops face uncertainty and danger with every step. Those who survived the initial landing, including Sergeant Tyne, Dana Andrews, and Sergeant Ward, Lloyd Bridges... Pursue Ooh. pursue a mission to take control of a farmhouse and blow up a nearby bridge. When the soldiers are not involved in enemy engagements, they pass the time in conversation while marching through the Italian countryside, but they always keep their objectives in mind. All right. That sounds like a war movie. <laughs> it, it is. Confirmed and delivered. <laughs> uh, but now uh, we're at the end here, so we're just going to tell you to, uh, to check us out. Um, you know, check us out uh, with clothes on, without clothes on, whatever you got to do. We're on the internet. We're our home base for our podcast, of course, is Age of Radio. And you go to ageofradio.org slash for screen. And country. And be sure to check our back catalog. We've got hundreds of episodes now. So We've many. been doing this for, for 90 years, and we've got so many episodes. <laughs> uh, check them out. And, and I'll tell you, we, I think we get better as we go. It's, we, we age like a fine wine, Jason. Damn straight. Um, if you really want to have fun, go back and listen to our April Fool's episode uh, from way back about Avengers, and you'll see what it's like when we're completely shit-faced. That's right. <laughs> Great movie. Um, oh, fantastic. <laughs> you, you, you referred to the movie in which we gave up on the premise three minutes in? Yes. Pretending <laughs> that, that it was one. a great movie? Because <laughs> we were too drunk? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, check that out. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter, whatever that is these days, at FSACpod, as in for screen. And good track. podcast. Make us your 599th tweet to look at. Uh, That's right. J- Jason, where can they find you? Well, if, if you if you can spare one for me, I'm at Jason D. McLeod. That is M A C L E O D. And hey, if you have a blue sky invite, send it over my way because I'm still waiting. I'm trying to get in. I want to get off the Twitter. If I can get into blue sky, I'll be set. Yeah, let's either let's <laughs> unless there is a drastic change in ownership. Um, I don't know that this uh, this this whole Twitter thing is going very well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, follow us for now, and then we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, but Jason, having said all that, do you, would you like to just, uh, you know, put a bow on this and, and, and... I think I would, Brendan. Okay. So okay. if you'll join okay. me, I just want to say to you, Brendan, and to all the people out there and to the, our lovely live audience here uh, at the Cambodian border in Vietnam, yes. Brendan, of course, a hundred miles down the river with his crowd. I'm up here with my crowd, very respectful, quiet crowd. Thank you so much for coming. And, out. and by the way, del- a delightful river water, just d- really oh. thirst quenching. God damn, it's just, it's got a certain taste to it. You just, you can't get that elsewhere. Mm, mm, Yeah. Mm. But that's it for this week, Brendan. So I just have to say to you, God save the king. Look out, it's the man called Sting. (gasps) And for Screen and Country, I'm Jason. I'm Brendan. He's coming. The man, you imagine Sting in Vietnam? We would have won that war in three years. Uh, Sting or Splash all around. Oh, just just uh, fucking uh, stinger splash to Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> Fuck it. Scorpion Deathlock, brother. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I want a drug culture on machine. It's not available. If you try it once, you will die. Your face will melt off. When you control the movie, go over your toilet body. Go over your toilet body. You love to party. What's not to love? The world I was on made Jagger and Richard look like droopy eyed arm was children. That's how I parted. That's how I parted. I was banging seven gram rocks. That's how I roll. Winning. I had one gear go. Epic. Winning. Are you bipolar? I'm by winning. Win there, win there, win, win, everywhere. Where? Absolute victory everywhere. Where? Where? I'm in a quest. You're gonna win everywhere. Right every single wrong. Right every wrong. I'm a total freaking rock star from Mars. Winning. Come on, bro. I got taco blood. Winning. Bottle my brain and be like, dude, can't handle it. Went there, went there, went, went everywhere. I've got a list, help me sort this. From the epic win to the desperate that win this. Chicken nugget, winning, bubble gum, winning. Pretending to text to avoid someone. Epic, winning, no dance, winning, no pants, winning. Breaking the rules of the Geneva Convention. Weak, Adonis blood, winning, by the club, winning. Giving needed women caresses and hugs. Epic, winning, childbirth, winning, calling birth, winning. Duh. Winning, winning. Ow, 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 ow. I was banging seven gram rocks. That's how I roll. Winning, I had one gear go. Epic winning. Are you bipolar? I'm by winning. Went there, went there, went everywhere. I'm a total freaking rock star from Mars. Winning, come on, bro. I got 
attack with love. Baby, you bottle my brain and be like, dude, can't handle it.